Cool. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're really gonna start with the very beginning, you know. And the very beginning is what is sound. <laughs> well, I'm sure you guys are very very familiar with all these things, you know. But just uh, as a reminder, you know, um, sounds are longitudinal waves. Well, you you have also other kind of waves, but mostly it's longitudinal waves, you know. And it's uh, in the air. It's just uh, it's just uh, a series of uh, zone of compressions and rarefaction, you know, so if I clap my hands, I create a wave, this wave propagates in the room, and, uh, and this wave is basically a zone of higher pressure that just like travels across the room, you know, and then uh, just uh, goes everywhere and, and, and disappear, okay? So sounds are zones of compressions in the molecules that are in the air and zones of rarefactions, okay? So I'm sure you guys are very, very familiar with that, but um, which brings me to a uh, question. Uh, what are the parameters of a sound? So it depends, so it depends on the kind of sound that you deal with, basically, because there are several kinds of sounds. So uh, there is only one parameter uh, that is shared by all the sounds, and it's the, uh, the amplitude, basically, of the, the sound. So uh, we're going to talk about the amplitude uh, right after that. Amplitude uh, is a pretty complicated parameter because it can be expressed on many different scales in many different ways. You know, it can be, it can be expressed as a pressure in the air. It can be expressed uh, as a voltage in an electronic circuit. Uh, and, uh, and it can also be expressed as a, um, a, uh, a perceptual measure of amplitude, you know, where you're going to be like, it's loud, it's not loud, you know, and all that, all those things, you know, so, so it's a pretty complicated parameter. So that parameter is shared by all the different kind of sounds. But uh, the other main parameter of a sound is going to be its frequency, but that only applies uh, to sound that have a frequency, right? That doesn't have a frequency. Uh, so, uh, so the only parameter shared by all sounds is its amplitude. Okay, which uh, is going to bring me uh, to the next slide. Very good. So, uh, amplitude is a complicated parameter. It's complicated because it's it's almost not perfectly understood, you know, by psycho psychoacousticians, you know, because it's, it can be a very precise parameter, but it can also be a very subjective parameter, uh, because we all, all perceive amplitude differently. Uh, so, uh, so I don't know, if you're, if you're a drum player, you know, and you've been playing for uh, 20 years, you probably perceive amplitude very differently than uh, someone who uh, never played drum, basically, you know. So, uh, so it is a very subjective uh, Parameter. So the first question I'm going to ask you uh, is: um, So let's say that I have one violin player in the room. Okay, um, how many violin players do I need if I want to double the amplitude of the sound of the violin player? So I got ten here. So it's not ten. Yes, so exactly, but that, that, that's like the next, uh, that's like the next, uh, the next thing. But um, so, if I have one violin player, I add another violin player, you know, and they play together exactly, they're exactly synchronized, you know. It's not going to double the amplitude of the sound. If I want to double the amplitude of the sound, uh, I need four violin players. Uh, if I have two violin players. I'm not doubling the amplitude of the sound. I'm multiplying the amplitude of the sound by 1.4 because that's an increase of 3 dB. If I want to, uh, if I want to uh, to double the amplitude of a sound, I need to increase its amplitude by 6 dB. And an amplitude, uh, an uh, amplitude increase of 6 dB corresponds of uh, having the, the source multiplied by four times, basically. So that's extremely important to understand that very, 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 very well. Because it means that sounds is not, ex like the amplitude of a sound is not expressed on a linear scale, but on a logarithmic scale. 
Uh, so, uh, so it means that uh, every time, so if I have one violin player, I want to double uh, the amount of sound of my violin player, I'm going to need four violin players. But then, if I have four violin players, and I want to double the amount of sound of four violin players, then I'm going to have to multiply the four violin players by four again, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I, every time I double the amount of sound, I need more, basically. Uh, and that's extremely important to understand that. So, how do we measure uh, the amplitude of a sound? What's the unit? What? Yeah, yeah, dB. So yeah, there are there are just many different kinds of decibels. We're not gonna like uh, describe all of them, but uh, but let's just say that uh, we're only gonna deal uh, deal with like uh, decibels uh, SPL uh, in a uh, in our case. Okay. So there is this very nice. Uh, websites <laughs> uh, that you can go to after the workshop, but uh, it's Sync uh, PL Audio, and uh, and it has a calculator of loudness. Okay, it explains all that very, very, very well, and uh, it even has a nice calculator here that you can use uh, to calculate the amplitude uh, of the sound. So, um, you see that that's why it's so complicated. It's because there are three different ways of looking at the amplitude of a sound. Okay? We can look at the amplitude of a sound as the acoustic intensity which is power and energy. And in that case the formula to go from the linear scale to the logarithmic scale is going to be this formula here. Okay, so um, in that case, if I want to double the intensity uh, of a sound, it's going to correspond to an increase of gain of three dB. Okay, but that's not what we're looking at here. Uh, in our case, we're looking at the the amplitude of the sound as a pressure. Okay, uh, which can also be expressed as a voltage in a circuit. Okay, and, uh, and also just um, amplitude. So that's what we want. And we see here that if we want to have an increase of 3 dB of the amplitude of the sound, it's going to correspond to 1.414 uh, times the, the, the source of the origin. Okay, so if I want to double the amplitude of my sound, I need an increase of 6 dB in the amplitude. Okay. Um, the one after that is uh, loudness. So that's like the worst word uh, in, uh, in music technology because it doesn't really mean anything basically. And it's, uh, it's very hard to understand it. But, uh, but loudness, uh, based on what psychoacousticians have measured, uh, in the case of loudness, if you want to actually have, uh, if you want to double the loudness, you need to have an increase of 10 dB, okay? So we're not going to look at that, we're not going to look at that in the frame of uh, DSP, so digital signal processing, and uh, in the frame of the algorithms that we're going to study, we're only going to look at that. And we're going to use those two formulas a lot, okay? So this formula here is the formula that uh, you use uh, to go from the linear scale to the deep uh, to the dB scale, okay, and uh, and that one here is the one that you use uh, to go uh, from uh, dBs to linear, okay. So if I give a value in dB here, they will give me the uh, the linear value uh, of and uh, and vice versa. So Faust has built-in functions for that. So we're probably never going to have to rewrite them and apply them as such. But, uh, but it's, uh, those formulas are extremely important, okay? Do you have any questions about that? I know it, it's, uh, that kind of thing is, uh, it, it's always very hard to explain because it's, uh, and, it, and it takes a while to process for people who are not familiar with that kind of concepts, but, uh, but uh, are you all good with that? Yes? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean there are there are a bunch of them. Like a very good one is by uh, is by Thomas Russing. Uh, 
It's like an entire book series. Uh, he's a professor here. He's very old now. He's like 85 or something like that. Uh, but uh, he wrote like the most state of the art book uh, on, uh, on acoustics that you, you can find. So, uh, so uh, yeah, Thomas Rosting is one. It's big though. It's, uh, it's like, uh, it's, uh, but um, this website is very nice too. I mean, uh, if you want to get like a uh, good understanding of all these things, you know, you should, uh, you should check that. Yeah, look. The Music Mathics book. Music yeah. Mathics book, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, music mathics. Yeah. Sure, sure. How do you spell rusting? Uh, R O S S I N G. Okay. And then, even if you didn't like fully understand that, like uh, we're gonna play a lot with all these things, and uh, and eventually you will you will understand. <laughs> Good. Um, so that's uh, amplitude. Then, so yeah, that's, that's the amplitude scale. So you can see here that it's not linear. You know, like the higher you go on the dB scale, uh, the more things get compressed, basically. So the difference that you have between here and, uh, and here is the same difference that you have between here and here, basically. You know, and, uh, and, the higher you go in the scale, the more like the, the space uh, between like one amplitude and the next one gets compressed, basically. Um, okay. So different kind of sounds and their parameters. So as we said, there are different kind of sounds. Uh, and I actually made a nice little fast program to demonstrate that and I'm gonna Open it in a new window. Oops. Ah, yeah. It's one of the little bug in Faust Live. If you close the first window, it closes all the other windows. Okay, there we go. So there are different kind of sounds. Uh, the most basic kind of sound that you have are uh, um, sounds that don't have a pitch. Uh, so that one, for example, doesn't have a pitch. It's just an impulse. Okay, it's just like clapping my hands. Okay, uh, noise. Doesn't have a pitch. So those this. Family of sound, we can't uh, measure their frequency because they don't have one, basically. Okay. However, uh, there are other kind of sounds that have a frequency. And the most basic kind of sound uh, that have frequencies are just sine waves. Uh, that's a sine wave. Okay. So I got this very nice uh, little program here. Uh, you, you don't need to install it on your uh, computer, but it's called Bloodline, and it's a real-time uh, spectrum analyzer. So, um, so if I look, if I look at uh, this uh, very simple sound, which is a sine wave, okay? Oh, you don't see, okay. Let me scale. That's so, there we go. Okay, so that's uh, the frequency axis, okay? That's the time axis, and uh, the brightness of the line is basically the amplitude of the cell, okay? So here I have a sine wave. The sine wave has only one harmonic, okay? And uh, that's, what we see, uh, that's what we see here, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if I deactivate my sine wave here, and if I put noise instead, noise is just totally white. There is nothing. Like, uh, it's because, uh, conceptually speaking, it's just having uh, millions of sine waves at the same time, basically. And they are super close to each other, you know, and it's very chaotic. So th that's why this sound doesn't have any pitch. It's because it doesn't contain any harmonics. It doesn't have any sine wave in it, okay? 
So the most simple kind of sound that I have are sine waves. And so the next uh, parameter that can be used with sine waves, uh, in addition to amplitude, is its frequency, right? So it's the number of vibration uh, per seconds uh, that this sound is going to, to have. So for instance here, the frequency of this sound is 440 hertz, which is an A. A. Very good, perfect. So it means that uh, I have 440 vibrations per second. So it means that the speaker here is vibrating 440 times per second to uh, deliver me this, uh, this, uh, this sine wave here. Okay. What? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, I don't have absolute. Uh, very good. Yeah, sorry. I don't have, a, I don't have perfect pitch. So, <laughs> okay. Well, here we're, okay, whatever. So, yeah, sorry. But, uh, but I didn't say that it was 440. Uh, so the, what is 440? But uh, yeah, no, no, but I, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so that's the most basic kind of sound that you can have, just a sine wave. A sine wave only has one uh, harmonic, only one frequency, and it's the guy that we see here, okay? Then we have more complex sounds, and more complex sounds have more than one sine wave uh, that constitute uh, them. So, so here if I add more sine waves, there we go. Here I have one, two, three, four, five. I have five sine waves. I can see them on my spectrogram here. Now I have a more uh, complicated sound. Okay? So in the real world, there are sine waves don't exist, basically. Uh, well, they exist on my computer. They exist when the speakers do that, but they even don't really make a perfect sine wave. Uh, sine waves don't really exist exactly in the real world. Uh, all the sound in the real world are sounds like that. There are sounds that are constituted of several sine waves. The sound of my voice has maybe, uh, well, it's probably more than that, you know, but uh, it has like at least 200 sine waves uh, that uh, uh, constitutes it. And, uh, and uh, that's how we can differentiate different sounds, basically. Uh, it's the position of those harmonics, of those sine waves in the spectrum, and their amplitude, basically. And, uh, and that's what constitutes uh, the sound uh, that we have uh, in our uh, environment. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's very, very basic, but uh, we really need to, uh, really need to, to do that. Okay, so we said that the most fundamental parameter of a sine wave is its frequency, which corresponds to a certain pitch, okay? And I said that uh, 440 hertz is an A, okay? What is gonna be the frequency of the next octave above this A? 880, exactly. So to go an octave above, I have to multiply the frequency by two every time, which means that frequency is not a linear scale too, right? Uh, because every time I want to go an octave above, I have to double the frequency, but because the frequency was already doubled the time before, it's not a straight line, it's not a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale. Right, so, uh, so we really have to keep that in mind. So just like for amplitude, the difference that I have between zero and 100 hertz here is gonna be pretty much the same than the difference I have between 3,000 and 15,000. So, uh, so the, the higher I go in frequencies, the, the more precision I get, basically, uh, uh, if frequency was only expressed as an integer, right? Okay, um, so in that case here, I am just creating a harmonic series. So here I have uh, my fundamental uh, frequency, which is gonna be 440 hertz, okay? So, yeah, that's more like an A. <laughs> so if I add an octave, the octave is gonna be at 880 hertz, okay? Here I got the next harmonic, which is a fifth above the first octave, you know, 
then a third, <coughs> then etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here we get a very funny uh, psychoacoustic uh, thing that is going on. I don't know if you noticed that, but uh, so if I do that. So if I do that, your brain still hears the four sine waves independently, right? Up to a certain point, you know? However, if I cut the sound and start those guys and then start the sound, I don't hear the sine waves. Because my brain, my brain, my brain is totally tricked, you know, and, uh, and can differentiate between the, the different sine waves. Um, so if I change the fundamental frequency, I can see that things are being spread more and more across the, the, the spectrum of the sound, right? Because of the logarithmic scale, right? Uh, so, uh, so the closer I'll go to the bottom, the closer uh, those peaks in the spectrum of the sound are, are going to be to each other, right? And then uh, the, the higher I will go, the further apart they will be, but, uh, but perceptually speaking, it will still be the same, right? So, so we really, really need to understand that very well because that's also very uh, important. Uh, concept that we need to go. But I'm sure most of you guys know those things like since uh, since you were born basically but uh, but uh, it's uh, it's very uh, it's very important to uh, it's very important to um, to refresh your memory on that. Any questions? No? Okay, very good. So, um, we don't really need anything else than that in the frame of the workshop in terms of acoustics uh, and in terms of how we perceive the sounds. That's enough. With that, we know, we know enough and, uh, and we'll be very comfortable with that. Uh, so the next topic uh, I'm going to talk about is how a speaker works. Okay, well, you guys know how a speaker works, I'm sure. But uh, so, you know, a speaker has a membrane. Okay. And this membrane is connected to a driver. Okay. So if I send a certain amount uh, of energy in the driver uh, and it's a positive energy, then the membrane of the speaker is going to go up front, like poof. Okay. Uh, if it's a continuous current, the membrane of the speaker will be pushed up front. Okay. Uh, by the way, how do we call that? Exactly, it's DC. Yeah, yeah, it's direct current. So, uh, so if I just sound uh, direct current uh, to the speaker, then the membrane will be pushed. Okay. If it's a positive signal, if it's a negative signal, then the membrane will be pulled. Okay. So when I play a sine wave. So when I play when I play a sine wave, and a sine wave is going to look like that, right? Then it means that uh, 440 times per second, my speaker is going to go up, then back to zero, and then it's going to go in the back, okay, etc. Okay, uh, and it's going to do it 440 times. Uh, per seconds. Uh, if I want to play an A4 uh, or A5, I never remember. A4. Okay, so um, microphones work exactly this. Oh, mi microphones work exactly the the same way, right? It's just that uh, it's, uh, it's the opposite. So so if I have a microphone, the microphone has a membrane, and the membrane of the microphone will vibrate, turn this mechanical vibration into an electric signal. And if I plug that to a speaker, the speaker will vibrate, right? Uh, so if I take the microphone and if I push the membrane, which is not something you want to do, but if I do it, then the membrane of the speaker will be pushed all the way up to the front, right? And then uh, if I take the speaker, uh, the microphone, and if I suck it, then the, the, the membrane will, uh, will go all the way uh, to the back, right? Uh, in between, there is an amplifier, because uh, if you just do it like that, it's not going to do anything, right? Uh, because you need to amplify the signal of the microphone uh, to, to, do, to do that kind of things, right? 
Okay. So it means that I can use my microphone as a speaker too, right? So if I take my microphone and I plug it to my stereo system in my living room, it's going to make sound. It's going to be very bad for the microphone. You're probably going to break it, but, uh, but maybe for two seconds, it's going to make sound. Uh, and the same thing with the speaker. I can use the speaker as a microphone. If I just yell in front of the speaker, and I'm really going to have to yell very, very, very loud in front of the speaker, then it, it will actually uh, record or like turn uh, the sound of my voice into an electric uh, signal. So, uh, so those two things are uh, close to each other. They were very well connected. So, in the old days, uh, in the old days when we wanted to record or process the sound from a microphone, uh, well, we were using things like that, right? Uh, so those guys here were basically recording the sound uh, either as uh, well. Uh, a magnetic trace on, on some kind of tape, basically, or as uh, an actual uh, uh, engraving on, a, on a, this piece of plastic there, right? Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so if I wanted to record uh, sound on a, on a vinyl like that, uh, I would just like send vibration in vinyl, you know, and engrave it, basically. You know? And if I was playing it back, then, uh, then I would be able to play back the sound. And same thing for the tape, except that here I use a magnet and a tape that is magnetized, right? And in the old days, when we wanted to do audio effects, we were using electronic circuits. And, uh, and the way we were doing it, you know, was just by, well, processing the signal with all these uh, components, you know, and just like turning it into something else. Okay. So that was in the old days. But now, fortunately, we have uh, digital technology. And digital technology for audio was brought to us by Max Matthews, uh, who was uh, emeritus, uh, emeritus professor here uh, until he died in 2012. So Max Matthews um, was doing experiments at Bell Labs uh, in the 50s, uh, mostly for telecommunication. And you know, and at that time they were trying to uh, to find ways to compress data for telecommunication, and that's by doing all these things that he actually figured out that uh, we could make audio on a computer. At that time you would not have been able to record a sound on a computer, but you could synthesize a sound on a computer. Uh, the reason why, because you couldn't record the sound on the computer is because computers were not powerful enough to uh, record a sound. They could synthesize it, but uh, it was probably taking six hours to synthesize uh, half a second of sound. Uh, and uh, so it was very, 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 very slow. There are a lot of great videos on YouTube that you can uh, watch, you know, and uh, there is, uh, I'm not going to play it because uh, I told you my laptop doesn't really like uh, Jack and Firefox, so I can't really play it back, but uh, uh, I will post that on the website, and if you want to check out the, the links, uh, there are a lot of very nice uh, examples uh, from that time and from like very, very, very early computer uh, music. Max here is in the old Max lab that used to be uh, where the neuroscience lab is uh, now. Uh, and uh, he's playing his radio band uh, that you, you saw in the lobby uh, downstairs. Okay. So, which brings us to the most important topic of the day, uh, which is digitizing a analog signal. Uh, so, going from analog to digital. Uh, once again, I'm sure that half of you in the room know that very well, but uh, for the others, you must understand that extremely well, because that's uh, something that we're going to use uh, a lot. So, how do we do that? So let's say that uh, I have an analog signal, okay? The analog signal is for example, a sine wave, okay? And uh, so here we go, I got a sine wave. So when my sine wave is in the analog world, it's, for example, in a, a speaker cable, and then it's an electric signal, right? Okay, so it's a variation of voltage in the cable, okay? So maybe one volt and minus one. Okay, so it's a, it's a variation of power. It's a variation of energy in the in the cable. 
Okay. So if I want to take that into a computer, so if I want to digitize this sound, I'm going to have to do this thing that we call sampling. Okay. So all computers have that. Uh, all phones have that. Like uh, samplers are everywhere. Uh, or analog to uh, analog to uh, digital converters are everywhere. And what they do essentially is that they are they are like multimeters that measure the voltage uh, of the signal that is coming in at a series of intervals. Okay. So what's going to happen here to my electric signal? that is coming in the cable and that is plugged to the audio interface of my computer, my computer is going to take one sample here, okay? And then one sample here, one sample here, one here, one here, one here, here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So it's basically going to measure the voltage of the signal coming in at a certain speed of intervals, right? Okay. So these guys here are going to be stored on the computer as a number, right? Uh, so what I'm going to get here is going to be a series of numbers. So a wave file on a computer, uh, as long as it's not a compressed audio format, is just going to be a huge series of numbers, OK? And those numbers are just the measurement of the voltage of the input signal, OK? So when I talk about digital audio, there are two parameters that matters uh, for sampling. What are those parameters? Sampling rate. Sampling rate. Bit rate and bit, bit depth. And the, not the bit rate, because uh, bit rate is going to be part of the sampling rate and the bit depth. But uh, yeah, the two parameters that matters are the sampling rate so the, the sampling interval, okay, and the bit depth. So sampling rate is pretty easy to understand, or probably guess what it is, right? It's basically the number of samples that I'm going to take per second. So sampling rate is expressed as a frequency. Okay. And that's something that we see on any DAW, uh, on computers, you know, and uh, any audio softwares. Sampling rates is everywhere. And the most standard sampling rates uh, that people use here is? Yeah, 44. Yeah, it's 44, 100 hertz. So it means that if I use this sampling rate, I'm going to make uh, 44 100 measurements of the amplitude of the incoming signals per second. So that's a lot. And that's why computers uh, from the 50s were not able to record a sound in real time, because that's a lot of information um, to process. Okay. So that's the first parameter. So this parameter is totally linked to something that we call the Nyquist frequency, okay? Because all these things, uh, like sampling theory is also called like Nyquist theorems, you know, Nyquist theory. So, so this parameter here is really linked to what we call the Nyquist frequency. So, it's very important. Nyquist theorem states that the highest frequency I will be able to record on my computer or to digitize is going to be half the sampling rate. Okay. So if I'm using this sampling rate, if I divide this sampling rate by two, then the Nyquist frequency is going to be 22,050 hertz. So it means that I can uh, record on this computer at this sampling rate any frequency between 0 and 22,050 hertz, okay? which is more than enough because uh, the human hearing range is between 0 and 20,000 hertz. 
in theory, that's like uh, when you when you were born, you know. But uh, but already the next day it started decreasing. So uh, so uh, so the older you get, the lower this number is basically. Uh, so for me, I'm 26. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably well. I, I've been playing music a lot, so so I'm probably a little bit below the normal average, you know. So the highest frequency I can hear is probably like 17. Uh, 16,000 hertz, you know, but the, the older you get, the worse it gets, basically. So, uh, uh, but it doesn't matter. 20 to 10 is just Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, so it means that 44, uh, 44 kilohertz is more than enough uh, to, uh, to just uh, sample all the sounds that we need, right? Um, plus, uh, the systems that we use here, uh, Okay, uh, I'm going to do something else before. It. Sorry. Uh, so why why is 22,050 uh, 22, uh, hertz the highest frequency that we can sample? Well, it's very very simple. It's because the higher the frequency, the more vibrations you get per second, right? So the less precision you have in your sampling algorithm, right? And there is a point where Say that this sine wave here is at uh, 22,050 uh, 22, hertz, where, okay, my first sample is going to be here, okay? The next one is going to be here. I'm going to use a different color. So the first sample is going to be here, the next one is going to be here. Uh, the next one is going to be here. Uh, well, actually, it's even worse than that. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, ex yeah, exactly. It's going to be here, 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 etc. Okay. So it means that uh, at this frequency, uh, if I try to uh, recreate my sine wave, it's still going to be at the right frequency. And because I'm using interpolation algorithms uh, in my, uh, in my uh, audio, uh, in my digital to audio converters, the, the interpolation algorithm is going to turn that back to sine wave again. Okay? So it's fine. It works. And there is no compromise uh, in terms of the quality of my sine wave. My sine wave as at, 22, uh, at 22 kilohertz is going to be as good as my sine wave at 100 hertz because of the interpolation algorithm. So that's a mistake that a lot of people uh, who know a little bit about that uh, but not enough do. They think that uh, the higher you go uh, in, the, in the, the frequency, the less precise your sine wave is, but that's not true. Like uh, with the sampling theory, this sine wave here is really going to be as good as the sine wave that you have at 100 hertz or uh, even lower. Okay. But the problem is that if I go above that, uh, even let's just say at 222.51, okay, then sine wave is going to be too fast and I'm not going to be able to take enough samples per second uh, to, to measure the sine wave. So what is going to happen is that it's still going to take a sine wave, but the sine wave is going to have the wrong frequency. Okay. And we call that aliasing. And the way it works is that if my Nyquist frequency is 22, uh, 22 uh, kilohertz and 50 hertz, uh, if I have a frequency in my signal that is uh, 22 and 51, okay? Well, the actual frequency of the signal uh, on my computer is going to be 22 and 49, okay? So it's like a mirror. It's reflecting it, but the other way around. If it was 22 and 52, it would be 22 and 48, okay? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a catastrophe then, because uh, if you have a lot of um, if you have a lot of harmonics above this frequency, uh, and you record this sound just like that, it's going to sound terrible because uh, there is going to be all these sine waves that are reflected to the bottom of the spectrum, and then it's going to sound very bad. Aliasing is also very uh, is also very common. Like it's everywhere, you know. Like if you look at the 
if you look at a movie of the of a, a wheel on a car, you know, like uh, sometimes uh, the wheel you're going to have the impression that the wheel is going backward. Uh, that's exactly the same thing than that. It's because the the camera is taking pictures at a certain frame uh, rate per second, uh, and if the wheel is going faster than that, uh, then it's gonna it's gonna go the other way around, basically. You know, and uh, so that's aliasing. So how do we prevent that? Uh, yes. Absolutely. So, uh, so uh, all the modern um, digital to audio converters or audio to digital converters on computers have a filter that is basically going to get rid of everything above this point. Uh, and that's what we call an anti-aliasing filter. And, uh, and that's an analog filter, uh, obviously. And it's very important. This filter is not here, then it sounds, uh, it's going to sound very, very bad, you know. And, uh, and that's uh, when people try to use Arduinos to make, uh, to make uh, audio interfaces, that's uh, very often the problem they encounter, you know, and that they didn't really think about, you know, because they, they don't know about aliasing, you know, and then they realize that uh, their signal is suddenly uh, is, is impossible to use because they didn't build an anti-aliasing filter in the Arduino. So. Okay, any questions so far about that? Yeah, I think that's uh, it's pretty, yeah, pretty straightforward. Okay, so um, so uh, what is the what is the benefit of using a higher sampling rate than that if we can't really hear uh, uh, what's after that? Because uh, on Blu-ray uh, Blu-ray DVDs, for example, the standard sampling rate is 96 kilohertz, uh, and then the Nyquist frequency is like like way 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 far after the yeah. There is that. There are there are several there are several reasons to do it, uh, but none of them is actually really 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 good. Uh, if you have to choose between a DAC that has this frequency that is a very good audio interface that samples things the right way, and one that has a very high sampling rate and that is a bad um, audio to digital converter. Uh, you'd rather choose the one that has a lower sampling rate because uh, it's uh, it's probably better to have them than to have like very high sampling rates. So, yeah. In studio applications, we, all, we always hear that one of the benefits of going higher is that you're going to process the signal a lot, especially in the digital domain, you're going to have plugins and stuff like that, and, and the artifacts accumulate more. That's the thing. Well, it, when, so one of the reasons in the digital domain to do that, and we'll, we'll see that later in the workshop, is the is this problem of aliasing, basically, kills the the... If you have a plugin that is a distortion plugin, for example, uh, a distortion plugin typically is going to create very sharp changes in the signal. And a, ch and a sharp change in the signal is basically a high frequency signal. And very often, this high frequency signal is going to be above the Nyquist frequency. Uh, so, um, so in, in theory, your algorithm is smart enough to prevent that from happening. But very often, uh, distortion plugins are going to have aliasing. And if you use this higher sampling rates, uh, you're going to prevent uh, the aliasing from happening because you're going to put the Nyquist frequency uh, uh, higher, basically. That's one of the main challenge in uh, uh, virtual analog, uh, virtual analog plugins, for example. For example, generating a square wave on a computer uh, is very easy, <laughs> right? It's very simple. Like the formula to make that, to make this function is a very simple function. The problem is that uh, here you get extremely sharp changes because uh, you get a square here, right? Uh, if you use your square wave algorithm as such and you change the frequency of it, it's going to have tones of aliasing because the frequency here, like the harmonics created by this point here, are going to be far above the Nyquist frequency. And, uh, and that's why it's so hard uh, for uh, engineers to make virtual analog uh, plugins. And that's why analog synthesizers uh, are still very popular, you know, because uh, on, in the digital world, you can do it, but it's extremely hard to do. And you can't just do it with a function. You, you have to basically build uh, a physical model of the, the analog circuit uh, uh, that you're using. Because if you just use a function like that, it's going to have tons of aliasing. And um, so that's one of the reasons to use a higher sampling rate. 
Okay. So uh, to finish with the session this morning, uh, and then we're going to have lunch. Uh, the 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 other parameter is the bit uh, depth, right? So the bit depth is basically the precision of the samples. Okay. So you know everything on a computer is stored. Uh, on certain amount of bits, right? So, uh, so if you store something on one bit, then I'm going to have only two options, zero or one, right? If I store something on two bits, then I'm going to have more options, etc., etc., etc. So the higher the number of bits I'm using, the more options I have. And the more precision I have, so the bit depth is the number of bits on uh, on when my samples will be will be stored, basically. So uh, there are two main standards uh, for audio. So 16 used to be a standard, but uh, now most people use uh, 32 bits, right? So uh, in the case of 16 bits, how many options? Am I going to have for 65,000 so. yeah, 65, or, or so? Because that's basically going to be 2 power of 16. Okay, 2 because 1 bit has 2 options and 16, uh, well, because uh, I'm using uh, 16 bits basically. Okay, um, so the higher this number, the more precise my samples are going to be. Okay. That's uh, very important parameters uh, because um, it's going to have a huge impact on what we call the dynamic range of my signal. Okay? Uh, if I have a lot of precision at this level, then I'm going to be able to, uh, to have a huge dynamic range for my signal. So it means that uh, if I record the sine wave here, and the, the amplitude of the sine wave is very, very small. You know, it's, uh, if the maximum is here, let's say that uh, in my case, my sine wave is more like that, you know? So if I take this sine wave and if I, you know, boost it up, change its gain so that its gain is going to be at the maximum, then I'm going to reduce its dynamic range, right? Uh, and so, uh, so if I change that and if I expand it, if I have a lot of precision in here, then I'm going to conserve the quality of my sine wave. Uh, if I don't have a lot of precision in here, and if I expand it, then I'm going to lose uh, precision, uh, precision in my signal. So it is a pretty important, uh, pretty important parameter. In general, people don't really have to think about it uh, when you deal with uh, signal processing algorithm because that's a it's a very implicit uh, value. Uh, we're going to have to deal with the sampling rate all the time. Uh, and we'll see that the sampling rate has a huge impact on everything that we do. So any algorithm that we're going to build during the workshop is going to be very often dependent on the sampling rate. Uh, bit depth doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, uh, it's going to change the quality of the audio, but it's not going to, it's not going to be big, a big deal for us, basically. So, uh, um, any questions? Okay, the last thing is, so that's all very uh, theoretical. But on the software side, okay, when I'm going to deal uh, with these numbers, because literally when I'm going to implement all these plugins, I'm just going to deal with all the samples and, uh, and uh, change their values, change, uh, change the, I'm going to deal with numbers basically. So on a computer, uh, there is a standard uh, for the range of the, of the value of the samples that I'm going to use. And, uh, and what is this standard? I mean, like the, what is going to be the highest value that I can have and what is going to be the lowest? Exactly, it's going to be 1 and minus 1. So all the signals that I'm going to deal with on my computer, when they go to the speakers, I want them to be constrained between 1 and minus 1. So it means that uh, I'm going to deal um, I'm going to deal with a lot of floating points all the time and, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, decimal values. Uh, so I really want numbers that have a very big precision after the decimal, right? Because the highest value that I'm going to have is going to be 1, and the minimum is going to be minus 1. So the range of this sine wave is going to be constrained between 1 and minus 1. That's 
only true for the output of my algorithm. I can have higher values than that uh, inside the algorithm. But when I send the sound to the speaker, I want my sound to be between 1 and minus 1. Uh, if I make a distortion pedal, uh, I'm going to boost the gain a lot, like by huge uh, amount. And then it's fine on the software side if the signal of my gain is uh, uh, coded between uh, minus 100 and 100. However, when it's going to go to the speakers, I want to put it back to between 1 and minus 1. Because what happens if uh, it's not between 1 and minus 1? Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to clip. So uh, get rid of that. So if I draw a sine wave again, okay. That's my sine wave, okay? So if one is here, minus one is here, it means that the gain is too high here and here. So what is going to happen is that, well, uh, the computer is very stupid, it's just going to get rid of that and that, and then my signal is not going to be a sine wave anymore. Uh, it's more going to be like a weird square wave. That's what we call clipping, right? So if the gain is too high, then I get clipping because uh, my computer discarded uh, uh, parts of my signal. Uh, in some cases, it's a feature, uh, but uh, in most cases, it's not. If uh, I, that, that's actually what uh, a distortion does. Uh, on a guitar, if you have a distortion, what you do is that you, you just like increase the gain of the signal and then you, uh, so you make it clip, you know, and then, uh, and then your signal is going to look more like that. The problem is that uh, on a distortion pedal on a guitar, this is done in the analog world. And in the analog world, uh, things are not as perfect as in the digital world. So instead of having very sharp changes here, it's going to actually round the edges here. Because the, the, the tube that you're using is going to have some kind of tolerance to that, you know. And, uh, so it's not going to be very sharp change. So here you're, gonna, you're more going to have like, you know, rounded edges here. It's going to sound good. Uh, if I do that uh, on the computer, it's not going to sound very good <laughs> uh, because of the sharp uh, edges. But we'll see that we can mimic this behavior uh, using some mathematical function uh, uh, when we'll build uh, the, the distortion uh, pedal. So once again, when the, when the signal comes in in my computer and when the signal is going to come in in my Faust algorithm, I will assume that uh, it is coded between 1 and minus 1. And uh, when it goes out of the algorithm, same thing. I assume that the signal will be between 1 and minus 1. And if it's not, then it's going to clip and it's going to sound like shit. So I don't want to do that. Okay? Any questions about this morning?